Bienvenidos. My name is Priscilla Salina Suarez, and I'd like to welcome you to this session for Women's History Month on behalf of the TLA Latino Caucus Roundtable. We're grateful to host this panel, which is Reflections on Leadership Inside the World of Latino Library Leaders. Thank you for joining this platica focusing on the experiences and journeys of celebrated Latino library leaders to learn how they represent and advocate for Latino communities effectively. Before we jump in, let me introduce our panelists. Retired librarian Maria Elena Ovalle holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Pan American University, a master's degree in science education from Pan American University, and a second master's degree in library and information science from the University of Texas at Austin. In her professional career, she has taught high school biology, has been a school librarian, a network specialist, and a regional coordinator for school library services. She has served on the executive boards of the Texas Library Association, the Texas Association of School Library Administrators, and is currently on the board of the Dustin Sekula Memorial Library, as well as being the president of the Friends of the Edinburgh Library Board. Esther Garcia has worked in academic libraries for over 10 years. She works on information literacy and library advocacy issues, as well as issues related to diversity and inclusion. She is currently the Dallas Campus Librarian at the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences, based in Irving, Texas. She has a Master of Library Science degree from Texas Women's University. Esther is active in professional organizations, including the Texas Library Association, where she has shared several committees. I really, really admire both of you. I admire both of you and all the work that you all have done, and, and I've kept up with everything that you've been doing because... You've been all over the place, you know, so I'm always really proud when I run across something on social media or, you know, just like the mentions um, for both of you. And so as leaders and representatives of the Latino Caucus Roundtable in the past, I, I have admired the work that you all have done for minority communities. Not only have you been advocates throughout your career, you've also been involved in various organizations outside of work hours. And reflecting on your advocacy work, what inspired you to be a voice for your community? And what support systems have you found along the way? Have there been any comadres or organizations you'd like to give a shout out to? Or you think that we should take time to learn more about? Yes, okay. I, I um, came into uh, the area of ad advocating for my community uh, rather late in my career because I started my career as a biology, high school biology teacher. And when you work in the K to 12 environment, uh, it's it's a, a very structured one where you don't have a lot of um, of uh, opportunity to advo ad really advocate for anybody except, of course, your students. And 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 looking back, I realize now that I didn't have any staff development, any training either in college or during my teaching career on how to support language learners, even though. I had many language learners in, in my classes and, and uh, biology is a language of its own too. So, you know, that you have, and, but then I also realized that just um, with uh, good street teaching strategies, you will cover uh, language learning too. And, uh, but, and then it wasn't until, and then I, uh, then I went to the library and, and uh, I was a high school librarian for about five or six years too. And, and even then I realized that I didn't actively go out of my way to support uh, the, the language, uh, language learning in the library or to um, actively go looking for multicultural literature either. And, and part of the reason was because I wasn't aware of it. Like I wasn't aware that I needed to do that because it wasn't covered in library school either. And uh, then, then it wasn't until I went to, to, uh, to work at region one and at region, uh, at region one, everyone was required to support language learners. And that's when I realized, wow, we we all need to do this. And, and that's, uh, um, when uh, I picked up a lot from the bilingual, the, the staff in the bilingual department at Region 1, and uh, I try, actively try to attend their staff development workshops that they provided so that I could learn more. And then about the same time, I had the opportunity to start working on a, a PhD 
with, and my mentor was Dr. Barbara Imhoff. And, uh, and she encouraged me to learn more about, about supporting language learners in the library. And that's how, how uh, really how I started, like how I started with, uh, we started the Tejas Star Book Award and, and we really start, started at Region 1 um, at, or in the Library Services Department advo advocating for language learners and for our community. And, and then along the way, I had many mentors and role models too. Like for example, I, I'm a little bit older than both of you. And I started school my first grade uh, in 1959, like 5960 was my first grade year. And back then we didn't have kindergarten. So uh, it, I was uh, immersed in, into just learning English, just like that because Spanish was my first language like it was everybody else's in the Valley. Uh, but I already knew a lot of English because I'm seventh, uh, the seventh of nine children. So all my older brothers and sisters spoke English and my parents were bilingual too. So I already knew and I used to watch, I grew up with Captain Kangaroo. I don't know, I, you probably don't even know who that is. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, I, I learned English and, and then looking back and also it, it, I attended Hidalgo schools, Hidalgo elementary school. And uh, I had Latino teachers and Latin, Latina teachers. So they were my role models from back then. My first librarian, Ms. Vela was Latina too. And she, uh, she used to, we, uh, she kept a really, you know, really good library for the time. Like most schools in the 50s and 60s didn't have libraries. Well, Hidalgo did, and they had a really good one too. So um, that's where I picked up the, the, uh, the reading habit because she'd recommend books. And we used to go to the library every single day. It, we had, it was like a study hall to us. So that, you know, that was like, a, uh, uh, our, I, I used to love going to, uh, to the library or library time. So, you know, those are some of the, of the mentors that I've had, like Ms. Vela. All of my teachers, like uh, Miss Baker, Mrs. Gorena, Mrs. Brown, even though they had English last names, they were Latinas. Uh, well, I, I would say I had mentors at Region One uh, uh, from the bilingual department, Dr. Sylvia Haddon, the executive director, Dr. Ellen Gonzalez, who was one of my supervisors, because they advocated for language learning and language learners in our community. Uh, Dr. Ida, um, Acuna Garza, whom all of you, both of you probably know from the South Texas Literacy Coalition. My older sister, uh, who went to college, she's the first one to go to college, like she's a six of nine. I'm the seventh of nine, and she was the first one in our family to go to college. So she sort of paved the way for, for the rest of us. And, and uh, you can see the gap here because I have five, five older brothers and sisters, and then it's like the five older ones, a big gap, and then the four younger ones. And the four younger ones all went to college and the five older ones didn't because they didn't have the opportunity because they were born before uh, the great society, you know, the LBJ's great society. After that, then uh, every, uh, more people had an opportunity to go to college. One of my older brothers went back to college after he retired from his first job. So uh, there are uh, five of the nine of us have college degrees. So, um, uh, the, so that, you know, that I think that we need to know that history because of what's happening today. You know, nowadays about the importance of, of uh, how national policy affects the education of a population and, and our community too. You no, know, so that's why, you know, that's why I'm passionate about advocating for our community. And, 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 and there are so many people who have mentor, you know, that have been my mentors and my role models and, and too many to name probably like, uh, for example, uh, Leti Leha from the Edinburgh Library. You know, she's, she does a lot for the community. Uh, let's see who else, Nora, well, Nora Galvan, she advocates for all of us. Uh, that's so powerful, <laughs> Maria Elena, about the Great Society. Mm -hmm influencing your sister and you watching her be able to do that yeah. and then you went off and became a high school teacher with your degree and then eventually you went to region one and you formed the Hastar book list now without the great society 
would we have the Texas book list? Maybe, maybe, maybe later, maybe just now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, <laughs> my, my biggest mentor uh, was my grandmother, uh, Minerva Morales de Garcia, um, born in, uh, in Coahuila and uh, spent uh, all of her formative years in Enosa, just across the river. So I knew her uh, as a poet, uh, local historian. She would write books of poetry, self-publish them. She did have a book of history that was published by the state of Tamaulipas. But she never drove. And there I am, nerdy high school Esther with my driver's license, going to visit her in Reynosa whenever I got a chance to hear her stories and her travelinguas. And we would go to archives. She would take me to interview people and she would find out the real stories of how uh, systems were created in, uh, specifically in the border. We would go to the archives at, um, at Pan Am at the time, UT RGV now. And that was, that was a highlight weekend. That was, if I had a great weekend, that was the weekend for me. And um, I learned so much. I learned, things there that I've never forgotten. And that includes the value of the small stories, the value of how taking a, uh, taking a story, how that can be recorded, it can be transcribed, and then it can be published. And that's our stories. That was like, it's so hard in uh, librarianship because um, the majority of librarians are not Latinx. They're not in the Latino population. It's majority white. And so when I have found mentors, they haven't been people that look like me or have experienced things that I have until later in life, until I became a librarian. That's when I met Maria Elena or when I met, uh, uh, you know, when I met other librarians that looked like me and had my experiences. In addition, uh, I have found uh, unofficial mentors in books, in blogs, La Bloga. And these are people that don't, aren't able to support me, but they're at least able to reflect back to me some of the experiences that I feel sometimes alienated by, uh, by the, the larger community. Uh, and then I can say to myself, I'm not alone in feeling these feelings. Uh, I'm not alone in feeling um, separated out. And then I can look for like the Tomás Rivera Award, or I can look at Buddha Belpre Award, and I can say, these are the things that reflect back to me, my community. One of the projects that we're working on with the Latino Caucus Roundtable is um, working on gathering and, and documenting and putting together our history. It's not a long history, but I think it's a very important history and a lot of work went into it, a lot of thought um, and a lot of effort went into creating our community um, here with the Latino Caucus Roundtable. And so I know both of you have had a big impact within TLA, within finding um, the, helping create these, these communities for us. And so I remember um, during one of our conversations about our history as a round table, there was a dis discussion about how the restructuring of our group came about after a TLA diversity and inclusion task force that was formed. Um, and so I, I'm trying to remember what the name was before. It was library services for Spanish speakers or yeah, it was, uh, uh, I wrote it, I wrote it down, I found it, services to the Spanish speaking, library services, services to the Spanish speaking. 
So when round when table. You, so it was L S S R T. It was an interest group back then. I was an interest a group. A round table, okay. but an interest group. So when when you were having those conversations, um, this is about how long? Like maybe like ten years ago, fifteen years uh, ago. Probably, yeah, about um, ten to fifteen years ago. I would it was say about 20, uh, 2011, 2012. And so back then when you were having the discussions of like, you know, just the restructuring of, of our group, uh, what was the vision that you saw um, and that you continue to see for our roundtable? And why do you think it's important for us to get involved in organizations such as this one? Okay, well, I, I thought uh, that in order to get more members, or this is what my understanding, you had to become a roundtable, like you, uh, because the interest group was a, for a limited number of members. And then uh, to expand it, we wanted it to become a, an actual round table. And, and it, it's, I think it's really important because you have to have a place at the table uh, to, uh, to express what you need and, and to let everybody know what you're about and, and to move forward. Because I think that if, if you don't have a place in, in the table, everybody else is gonna move, move forward without you. You know, like they, because they, Everybody who is at the table has their uh, their own ideas, their own concerns, their own uh, issues. So you have to be part of that, so that that everybody uh, knows about your issues and and your concerns. And so you have to have a place in, in within TLA, an important place or a prominent place. I, I'm not sure if I'm using the right words. Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I had noticed uh, because I, when I came in, uh, it was when it still had its own name, Library Services to Spanish Speaking. At the time, it was it had become a roundtable, so it was just it must have been just past the interest <laughs> group state. But this might have been 2010, 11, maybe 12. And uh, what happened was I had seen how the like just visually just you know you get your uh packet in the mail with all your events for uh, the conference and there's all of these events sponsored by the black caucus and i thought oh they have so much support where's our place and the only thing i could see like just visually and i guess our old website was like the old TLA website, not just the Latino, the library services to Spanish speaking round table was, you know, not great back then. It's definitely gotten a lot better now. So it was really hard to find. It was just so hard to find information. You had to be in the, the meeting, the meetings, not the events. You had to be in the meetings to know what was going on. And I had no person to ask. So I had, I did notice it was a Houston conference and it was panel followed by business meeting, LSSSRT, uh, Library Services to Spanish Speaking Roundtable. And the, the one person leading the meeting was on her own. And it was really, uh, you might not have been there, Maria Elena, Elena. Well, this one particular, mm -hmm. and that's when I was like, "What's gonna happen?" You know. Uh, and at the time, it was really rough because uh, they had just announced, uh, for my years, that Latinos were about to be the majority minority in Texas, and this was more than ten years ago. And I thought, what are we doing for our population? I was not as aware of, I was aware of the Tejas uh, reading list, but I thought if the Black Caucus uh, can have all these events at TLA, where are we? We're the majority, we're about to be the majority minority. So I started attending the business meetings after that. And at one point I became the chair that's when um, Oralia Garza de Cortez, who's the co-founder of the Pura Belfry Award and the Tejana, and actually a uh, Rio Grande Valley native like us, she uh, pushed me. And 
I think y'all can tell I'm a little bit, you know, hesitant and shy, but she brought me out and said, Esther, you, you have a, you're seeing this, uh, somebody has to do it. So she pushed me to, to chair the, the round table. And she's the one who suggested, that's my memory of it, is she's the one who suggested that we change the name to the Latino Caucus Roundtable. And immediately, that was a big difference from going to LSSSSSSRT to Latino, to now Latino Caucus Roundtable. It's easy to say, easy to tell what it is. And, um, that's my memory of how that happened. My vision for what was going to happen was looking at the statistics. You know, we are a community that is beautiful and it's strong and we have like sad stories and we have happy stories and we have delicious food and then we have terrible cooks sometimes like I'm a terrible cook. Um, and we have all this vibrancy I'm not seeing it reflected. Uh, and at the time, Maria Elena Valle was working on the Texas list, but it had not been incorporated yet into TLA. Right, it was, came in 2011 or 12, because we started the, the award in 2007. And then it, was, it wasn't until 11 or 12 that it went to TLA. Around, yeah, in around that time, just after that, it was about 2013 that the hashtag We Need Diverse Books just took over Twitter. Uh, and it was like an April or something. It was like March or April. I remember it was in the spring. And there was somebody that held up like a picture of why we needed diverse books. And it's because like whatever state she was in, Georgia or something, that the one diverse book that they had on their book list was about an African-American young man that was in prison. And she was like, that's not representative of our community. And I thought, is there, a, what's our lists? And so I dove into the biggest list we have, like the most brightest, shiniest one, which is the blue bonnet list. And I noticed that there were very few titles that were uh, nominated. Chato's Kitchen, not nominated. Uh, Laughing Tomatoes, not nominated. Uh, the Circuit, Trino's Choice, Under the Royal Palms by Alma Florada, A Belly Button Moon, none of these books nominated. And, uh, and it just made me think, I, this is when I need to step up. This is where I need to have my voice. And that's was where my advocacy came from. I was also, you know, a thought came to my mind when you were talking about the Black Caucus and how many uh, sessions they had. Uh, looking in, from the inside of Taylor, because I, I, I was on the executive board for how many years? What's our term? Three years. And when I was there, I saw how everything is funded. And that's another reason why it was important for the Latino caucus to uh, caucus uh, to, uh, to, or the, the interest group to, uh, to um, become a caucus was because the caucus would have more members and thus more funding to have those sessions because everything at the conference costs money. You know, you have to fund it somehow. So if we, the more members that we have uh, in the caucus and more members, uh, that will pay into it and the, the more opportunity that we'll have to present different sessions at TLA to sponsor sessions. That's another reason why it's important for the funding because that, you know, that's, that's how, it, um, how right. TLA works. Yeah, that's how it Other, works. Otherwise, there's no budget. Like, right, there's no budget. We're, scramb we're scrambling on our own. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So one of the biggest supports that we've had these past couple of years um, we have with the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, we mm -hmm. have Laura uh, Tadena, who's now, um, she's there representing us. She's part of our 
our round table and the support that we've had because of her, you know, just having that representation um, has been huge. So she, she, I consider her one of our round table and Latina uh, librarian activists. And that's the same way I feel about both of you, about you, Maria Elena, who um, I've seen you working along with your comadres and like I, I see you and I think of Aida and I think of Nora and how you have paved a way um, and you've made it so much easier. Like, you know, you've made it so much easier. There's so much work to be done, but you've made it easier for us to find those resources, to, to learn and to know that we have to be looking for them um, and to know that, that it's our obligation to get this work done. And then with you, Esther, um, one of the things I've learned is that there's opportunities for us to, to get involved, even within, you know, TLA. Um, just the fact, like, with being a part of this round table, you pushed me. <laughs> you pushed me, you pushed me, you know. You're going to be at, at the conference. You have to come join me. Like, you know, so I learned a lot from you, um, from both of you. And there's so many doors. There's so many opportunities. And there's so many ways for us to connect. And, you know, being part of the, the board with the Latino Caucus Roundtable, um, I've seen how much work there is to do. And uh, I can't imagine, you know, back in the days, there be only one or two people um, actually running the whole show because right now our board, we have a full board and we have so many people that, that support us and help us out as advocates for our communities. Um, you all have a few other uh, ways that you support and you document um, our story. So Maria Elena, I just saw recently on social media, uh, your painting, your artwork, and it is so beautiful. And I've seen them in the past, but can you tell us a little bit about your art and, um, and how, what it is that you're documenting through that and what influences you? my memories mostly well I, I I'm not a professional artist I took classes at the Edinburgh library uh with two really good artists and there were a series of classes I think uh, uh Romy uh, Romy can't remember his last name now Guevara Guevara and Beatriz uh Guzman uh, uh yeah Beatriz Guzman Velasquez and there were uh, the library the friends of the library sponsored a series of, of art classes and and I think each series was about six six weeks so that's my background in in like how um how I've learned the art but I and I don't paint that much I I because I have in order to to paint some a picture I have to have inspiration like I have to it has to be for a purpose and uh because you know like I just don't pay because it takes time because you know like it takes time and planning and and uh patience and and so what i'm i'm documenting are my childhood memories like i'm, I'm, I'm just trying to remember recall and and the, the last painting the one with the people dancing i was a toddler around that time so my memories are are very like faded and all i remember are the lights because there used to be lights uh, a lot of like string on a string and and uh, the benches that were around the dance floor because I'd run on top of the benches when they're you know during the day, I, and uh, and the rest of it. And I remember the chimney where they used to cook the tamales, but the rest of it I think I get from uh, from what uh, what my brother, older brothers and sisters talk about, and my what my parents used to say about about that time, like about the dances and the and and things that used to happen. Now the other, uh, like that my childhood home is no longer there, but those are actually my memories. I remember it very clearly. So I, I painted for my brothers and sisters from my family and most of the paintings are Christmas cards. Like I, my brothers and sisters are used to me painting a scene from our childhood every year. And I send it, I, I make copies of the painting and send, send the painting to them every Christmas. So every year they, they start asking me around September, what's your painting going to be this year? We can't wait to see it. <laughs> and so uh, so it's always something from our childhood. 
that, that for Christmas cards. Now I have painted uh, like flowers and birds. I like to paint birds because they're easy. But that's uh, the, the my series is from childhood, from my childhood. And now too, because like, for example, La Lomita Mission is still there. The other Lomita burned down, like the, the, uh, the novitiate burned down. Uh, but part of it is still standing. And uh, and the church across the street has been remodeled a little bit. I like it better the way it used to be <laughs> rather than the way it is now. So I painted it the way it used to be because they put up they put uh, put a porch in front of it and I don't like the porch. It doesn't match to me. <laughs> I don't know. But I, and uh, so that's that's um, and I, I try to put culture into it, like the dancing, the the churches, the the. The, uh, in our childhood culture. Uh, you, have always, you have the clothes, you have the accordion, you have the hats. Yes. Uh -huh. You have the details. And that's that's what I love yes. so much about this, specifically this painting uh, from Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Church. Yes. Uh, it's from our I just house. love how specific it is. It reminded me immediately of how Carmen La Mascarza gets so specific. Yeah, and, and, and I could feel like, your childhood. And this this particular painting is a very small one, so I couldn't get the detail in the faces. It would have to be a big painting in order for the detail. And and the reason that it's small is because this painting, uh, my sister asked me to paint it for a newsletter because in Gran Geno, She's a, one of the city commissioners in Gran Geno, and she uh, she publishes a newsletter. And she says this this month, uh, and they feature a family every year. And this month, it was going to be our family. And she says she asked me, "Could you paint a picture of the dances?" <laughs> and I and and she asked me this about two days before she needed it. <laughs> I said, "What? You know, you need time. I need time to plan. I, and it has to be small because we have to copy it." Yeah, I loved it because these are, it feels like a snapshot that sometimes we're not able to access or we don't have. Um, and so I, I just thought it was so beautiful when I saw it. It's like, hey, Maria Elena, what is she not into? <laughs> the fit, and that was in the 50s. Did you notice the petticoats, like the, the dresses with the, the big flouncy petticoats? On? <laughs> that was, uh, I pictured, one of them is supposed to be my older sister dancing and she's uh, my older sister is about 16 years older than I am so um because there's a big gap in my family my oldest sister is 20 years older than my youngest brother and so she's one of the older the, well she is the oldest one and she remembers dancing and twirling around and that's what I try to capture the twirling in the on the dance floor that's beautiful so I um Last year at, at TLA, we had had a similar panel um, where we were looking at, inside the role of Latino library leaders. And the next two questions are actually, they're the exact same questions that I had asked Nora Galvan and Ramiro Salazar. And they had such, you know, such great input. And I'm like, I decided I needed to pick your brains a little more. So I wanted to ask, looking back, back at all the transitions that you've experienced, not only in libraries, but also in your communities, what are the strategies you'd recommend for building bridges that change the marginalized experiences of Latino patrons? My, our library, the, or my town library, the Edinburgh Public Library does a lot to reach out to the, to the community. Like for example, whenever they have workshops for the community or uh, programs for the community, they translate to Spanish. Like they say it in English and then they say it in Spanish. So it's it's very important to try to do that and 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 for and if there are no librarians who speak the language or no or no employees, at least use strategies to to um, that'll help the 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 Spanish speaking or the other language speaking patrons understand what you're saying, like use pictures, use signs, yeah, um, speak slowly. And then, uh, and something else that our library does is is, is they have uh, programming for, like for ESL, 
uh, for uh, resume building, for um, well, many uh, for college, you know, college uh, applications. Like they have a station for students to apply to college, and and so things like that. You know, like that's that's how how the library can can be very relevant to so to the community and can support the community. And having, of course, a multicultural literature that is relevant too. And that I find sometimes even in this area that, that uh, our libraries don't have enough, enough multicultural literature. Like many times when I see a book that has come out and I, I, I'm, I wanna read it, I check my libra the library catalog and this is for all of Hidalgo County and they don't have the book. So then I'll, I'll call the, the library and ask them, can you order this? And they always do. Like they, uh, they always order what the, the citizens request or usually they do it if it's in the budget. And, but, you know, I, I or even the, his, the books from the past, you know, like some historical books that, that are culturally relevant that the libraries don't have. I ask them, can, is it possible to get this one? And, and sometimes they do. It's, yeah, it can be really hard um, with acquisitions when you have uh, so a lot of uh, culturally relevant literature that comes from small presses. Maria Elena, you know this way better than right. I do because you curated book list after book list for Teja Star. But if a book is not re reviewed in a professional uh, journal, libraries might not purchase it per, uh, per their um, guidelines. But there are so many of our voices. And so if I want the, your voice inside of my library and to have access to it, do I have to wait for School Library Journal to review, um, to review your book? That puts us at such a disadvantage. And so having people in our community like Maria Elena who are requesting the book and are saying, I want to read this book, this you know, this is an author I'm interested in, or this is a story I'm curious about, and I want access to it. You know, that small press kind of, you know, it kind of separates out what's available and what isn't. And that can put us in a really tough place when we want culturally relevant books. Although I, I think that that libraries are getting better about that, that, that they or at least the Edinburgh Library does uh, promote the books of local authors. Like yeah, they, they Edinburgh to, Library does a really good job. Even though they're self-published and they're not reviewed, but uh, they try to, and, and that's another thing, uh, another way that libraries could, uh, could support the community is to give the local authors a platform or, or authors that are, uh, that multicultural authors a platform. Uh, for them to present at the library or to be uh, uh, part of, of the programming, the library programming. What and are I the things? Oh. No, go oh. ahead. So I was, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One of the things I really love about the Rio Grande Valley, uh, especially coming of age and being like in my 20s when I was with Lena, we were, or with Priscilla, sorry. Uh, it, we had friends that were in rock bands and punk bands. We had friends that were uh, like, of, they identified with different genders. And I think that that's something like young people from South Texas, Latinx community are uh, like being so vocal and proud about. They're, we're so proud of who we are and even using the term Latinx. Uh, I know it's like there's different feelings about it. And so it's really fun to be in a place where we have different feelings about La the term Latinx. It's really fun because we're in, in a world of exploration. We're in a world of trying to figure out who we are. And for me, building bridges uh, to marginalized uh, communities is being honest about who our community is and that we're definitely not a monolith. And when I look at 
I know I'm turning into like a Tejas Star reading like poster board. But when I look at the Tejas Star book list, that's what I see. I see not one experience. I see many experiences. And uh, to me, that's building a bridge. That's saying to our community, we care about you and we, we see you. We see exactly who you are and who you're telling us. You see, Marilena, <laughs> yes, <laughs> your, your, your trajectory, like, um, you know, just just thinking about it and and seeing how our libraries are cultural centers. Um, they are they're they're really reflective of our communities, and and that has to do a lot with um, the work that went into it, uh, because libraries have have since you know. I've been in the library system for almost 15 years. It's drastically different from when I started, drastically different. Um, and just the fact that the diversity has changed so much and yet not enough. Um, so I'm really glad that you touched, based on that, Esther, about how important it is for us to have access to these written lists because they're curated by librarians um, who take a lot of time, um, you know, a lot of time to actually reach out to, to presses and publishers and go through the shelves, you know, try to find books that, that, um, that reflect us. And so it's a lot of work and, and Maria Elena, so around what year was it when that transition went from it becoming, being an award to being taken over by TLA? I think it was around 2011 or 12. I, I'm thinking 2012. I'd have to check the, for the exact date, but the the award it was an award uh, from two, 2011 until it went to TLA. I mean 2007, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then and then it went to T and eleven, I think, and then it went to TLA. And and I and, and uh, uh, another one of my mentors was Pat Smith because uh, you know Me she's too. so. Yeah, she was. She, she, uh, I, uh, you know, I felt uh, that I could approach her to ask her if they would take on the, the Teja Star. And, and she said yes. You know, she was very supportive. And I, she was al always very supportive. I, I want to echo what you said, Maria Elena. For me, Pat Smith, so when I met, Olalia Garza de Cortez, she was like a star in my eyes. Like who, who, especially in the Latinx community didn't know the Buddha Bell Prey Award. And mm -hmm. the fact that she was taking time to like get to know me and spend time with me. I was like a young, not even a librarian at the time, but I was involved in the library field. And I, and she saw something in me and she nurtured it. Now, when I approached Pat Smith about something that I was really terrified about, about bringing more diversity and inclusion into the book lists, uh, the non tehas book lists, she gave me a platform and I couldn't believe it. And she nurtured that after that as well. I, I didn't think that I would ever be interviewed for something like this reflections on leadership because we all have our leadership moments but the fact that that pat smith and oralia de garza de cortez gave me that opportunity was incredible and then not long after that like maybe the following year i met maria elena ovalle and the fact that you've always treated me I, I, you were already like um celebrity status in, in my <laughs> eyes and the fact that you treated me as a colleague and that you respected what I had to say and you encouraged it and you told me your perspectives and you gave me um, information about how the organization works. It was, it's, it's still like, I'm, I have no words. I'm so grateful to the three of you. And I, I really like your spunk too. <laughs> that I wish I were more like that because I'm more of a, a quiet, uh, stealthy person. When I was thinking about this question about building bridges, mm -hmm. I was thinking that that is such an important characteristic to have when we are building bridges. And I think that this 
honestly can be a really tough place for us in the Latinx community. And especially as, as a woman, I feel like I'm always, not always, but often having to measure whether I can speak up. And with you right. all, I can speak up. Yeah. But am I going to be able to speak up in front of other chairs or in front of um, like people that have really, really strong opinions that are not like my own? And that can be very uh, anxiety provoking. And I have left TLA meetings upset and sad and rejected by people that uh, didn't see the way I saw things because it wasn't people in, in our community. And that was fine. They have every right to advocate for the way they see things. But it, it you saying that makes me really happy, but it really like building those bridges is so, <laughs> it's so hard. And it's, um, it's something we continually are doing. And sometimes I feel like that Greek myth Sisyphus with the rock, right? And we're pushing that rock up and rock up and rock up and <laughs> it's all the way back yeah, but, down. You know, it's something that needs to be done. You know, like we have to speak out. We have to, to advocate for ourselves and for our community. Yeah, so Esther and Maria Elena, mm -hmm. like there's a, a question I've been wanting to ask you. How can we advocate? What steps can we do? How can we start? Um... Be, be present. You have to uh, yes. uh, volunteer. You have yes. to get yourself into committees. Yes. Be, you have to, to represent. Yes. That's important. That's so important, representing. Because yes. we're the only ones who can do it. Or Absolutely. who can speak for ourselves. Like with, with honesty, with clarity. You, you'll have somebody from the executive board in your round table or in your district meeting that will ask you sometimes, is there anything you want to bring up, me to bring up to the executive board? And it's so easy to tell that person, no, I've trained myself to have something ready. And uh, it's always something to do with diversity and inclusion, whether it's we did a great job this year. I want the executive board to know that I, I see it. Or the opposite. I, I wish we had had this author. They just like came out with this blockbuster book and why weren't we able to da 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 da. Like, so that's a place, like be present, just like Maria said. And when you, <laughs> when you see something, you say something, you know? You're, yeah. uh, and sometimes you do it uh, quietly and stealthily. And if your nature is more like mine, <laughs> you come out like the Kool-Aid man from the wall. <laughs> You're like, everybody. <laughs> okay, so for the last question. In your opinion, why are libraries catalysts of social change? Because uh, you you have so many opportunities to, to uh, for in, in as far as your programming and whom you partner with to to advocate for social change like you uh with you, especially with your programming like you can bring people in you can try to to uh, educate them uh convince them of uh, of certain things and and convince them that they can do or, or about what they can do and what they're capable of and, and you have so many opportunities to partner with outside organizations, like, for example, uh, with nonprofits who promote social change, too. So that that's one or two ways of, do, of doing it. I remember when uh, they were I went for some reason, I went to the inauguration of the McAllen Public Library, the new one, uh, the new beautiful McAllen Public Library. I think you're sitting in it now. Yeah, we just celebrated 10 years. And I remember one of the, the board members saying, you know, somebody sees computers, I see like the means for people to get a job. And that is, that's radical. That's wild. And so some of that 
access to uh, Wi-Fi is at a premium. It's controlled by <laughs> some companies that, I mean, obviously like infrastructure is huge and it has to play a huge role in that. But having access to the internet and being able to submit an application, write a resume, uh, download pictures of your grandchildren. I mean, that is, how is that not a catalyst for social change? That is incredible. That's so, so powerful. Some of those things are possible due to, uh, due to guidelines from the library and the ability for the library to, to provide access. But what other place that's not a library, can people just come in, sit down and not spend a penny, not spend a penny of their dime to be able to read or to be able to feel safe for half an hour? Or I just got my nephew, uh, a Nintendo Switch video game from the McCallum Public Library. I mean, how is that not a catalyst for change access? Thank, thank you so much for, uh, for doing that McCallum Public Library specifically, because that's my biggest experience. And broadband, you know, and, and uh, I, I just have to mention that, that right now at this moment, uh, Gran Heno, you know, my little town is getting uh, fiber connected to the house, like my sister's mm -hmm. homes were just connected yesterday. And and uh, so when they have a library, they're gonna have uh, broadband to like that fiber. So that, that's a, a big catalyst for social social change. Like just the, 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 the um, you know, the, the uh, this administrations and maybe the previous one too, the, the broadband, the promotion of broadband across all, communities. So something, a big social change or, or a big opportunity for social change is coming to. But yes, yes, libraries. Let me see. And I, and I was thinking also about uh, our public library and how, how they promote so many festivals that are culturally relevant. And that, that gives the community an opportunity to, uh, to participate. So libraries, you know, that have give the opportunity for any community member to participate and to be uh, to feel welcome. Yes, and to feel like uh, like that they're seen by the community. Right. Uh -huh. So, but do you guys have any like closing comments or remarks for us? I have a question for Maria Elena. Well, what do you think of this younger generation of Latinx librarians that are uh, becoming active? Um, well, I, I think it's great, <laughs> you know. It and uh, but sometimes I wish that they uh, that uh, I, I'm not sure that they're that aware of certain things that they need to be aware of, you know, like. For example, uh, some examples that I see is, is that sometimes they don't, they're not aware of the literature, of the oh, literature that, or maybe, and they could be like I was when I was a new librarian that I just was clueless. Right. And, and because I didn't have the, the training that, or, you know, like I didn't get that in library school. I didn't be, get that in my staff development. To be fair, I mean, just looking back at the literature, like mm -hmm. in the 80s, there was maybe like just a handful of young Latinx titles. Felita, let's see, um, Renner in the Sun. Yeah, back then. 85, when was... Esteban and the Ghost. Um, Farolitos, yeah. The Boy Who Made Dragonflies. That was in the 80s. So it's tough. Like there... There's definitely a dearth yeah, of now literature. And then uh, I, uh, and, and there's so much more ad advocacy now, like with, uh, we need diverse books and, and uh, Dignidad Literaria. I'm sure that you're familiar with that, to, to that drive. Yeah, uh, Priscilla, you, you were in a panel for that, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, was it? It's been a Three years, maybe three and years. And I remember ago. the thing or I two. know before in the before oh, times. Yeah. 
And I remember the thing that you talked about was uh, our uh, our social capital, the value of our social capital, and that we have some, and that we have social capital. Yeah, definitely. Which is a term I learned from you. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I had never heard that word until you used it once, and after that, it's been, you know, I. It's a great word. It. It's a great phrase. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm inspired. I am inspired to see like the younger generation be fearless. Yeah. And we need it now. We need it now so much. I, I remember when I became, when I was in library school, I had already been working in libraries. Uh, someone talked about how librarians were the new cupcake. It was the new trend. I would have never thought that I would see like a New York Times article calling us silly librarians was in an article it was an opinion piece and we need that we need our voice right now we need to be we need to like measure our space and build bridges but we also need the energy that the younger generation is bringing and with the all the the like the technical stuff that they do the tick tocking and the and the instagramming <laughs> yeah instagramming yes the promote you know they promote social change through through technology yeah and through so some great. really great dances yeah mm -hmm. thank you so much thank you both so much Marielena and Esther we're so grateful to you for sharing your time and consejos with us during this panel on behalf of the TLA Latino Caucus Roundtable I would like to thank you so much for joining us today